Hello, this is New Testament video 170, Luke lesson 13. We'll continue in chapter 4 of Luke. Chapter 4 of Luke, Luke 4 verse 14. Father God, thank you for the enlightenment that you will give us here. Provided that we study, we search the scriptures, we compare verses, you will bless this time of study. Thank you, in Christ's name, amen. Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, in our last lesson, we studied the temptations of Christ, the first 13 verses. The Lord Jesus is now in the ministry. He's going head to head, face to face with Satan and one, most importantly. For the next three years, the spiritual battle between God and Satan will rage within the confines of the nation Israel. The borders of Palestine, they are the focus of the spiritual battle that has been raging now for 6,000 years. The Lord Jesus Christ has been tempted in all points like as we are and he's been proven to be without sin. So now, Luke 4, verse 14, And Jesus returned in, in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Come over to Matthew 4, Matthew 4, Matthew 4, verse 12. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. Notice how Matthew provides information that Luke didn't, and Luke provided information that Matthew didn't. And we'll see that as we continue studying Luke 4. Jesus is in the area of Galilee. When he hears that John the Baptist was thrown in the prison. Now Luke is aware of John's incarceration. He looked at it ahead. Back in chapter 3 of Luke. Verses 19 and 20. Luke shows us he is aware of John's imprisonment. Now Luke mentioned it out of chronological order. To get John out of the way to introduce the Lord Jesus. In Matthew, we see John is in prison now. Jesus goes into Galilee upon hearing of John's Captivity. So the Lord is in Galilee up north. Down south he was water baptized in the river Jordan here, north of the Dead Sea. Christ now moves into Galilee. His Galilean ministry begins. It will not end until chapter 9. Verse 50. Now, Luke doesn't have as much information about the Galilean ministry as Matthew and Mark do. So that's another variation. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, Jesus goes into Galilee. It says he leaves Nazareth and he dwells in Capernaum. 
So Matthew is aware of Jesus in Nazareth. He doesn't provide any details about that ministry, though. Luke will, as we continue in Luke chapter 4, we'll see why the Lord was in Nazareth, what he did, and why he left. And now he's in Capernaum. Say more about that later. Compare Jesus in Galilee here to Mark 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Back in Luke, Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. He's returning in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. See the Holy Spirit here? The power of the Holy Spirit. That's frequently referenced in Luke. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit working. Christ is submitting to the Holy Spirit, working. He's operating according to the Father's leading. Luke 4, verse 14. He goes in the power of the Spirit into Galilee the area around the Sea of Galilee, especially to the west of the Sea of Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. His fame is spreading. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Later in chapter 4 of Luke, Luke 437, and the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. He performed a miracle there, an exorcism, casting out an unclean devil, evil spirit. In chapter 5, verse 15, but so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Chapter 7, verse 17, And this rumor, this news, this report of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. The Lord Jesus is becoming more famous as he conducts his earthly ministry. He's teaching, Luke 4.15, He's teaching in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Remember in Isaiah, back to Isaiah, look at it, Isaiah 50, Isaiah 50, verse 4, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning, he wakeneth mine ear to hear is the learned. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. His heavenly Father is teaching him, he's listening. And now he's teaching others what he's heard his father tell him. That's what we should be doing. As members of the church, the body of Christ. 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. How to conduct...
the local ministry, the, the local church. 2 Timothy 2.2 2. Timothy, this is the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. I taught you. So the same information I taught you, you commit to faithful men so they can teach others. See, that's where we failed. Corporately, as the church, the body of Christ now these 2,000 years, we have not taught the same information that the Lord through the Apostle Paul taught us. We've drifted. We taught this, we taught that, but we didn't teach grace. We didn't teach others. And that's why there's ignorance everywhere. We didn't listen to the Father who sent the Son, who sent the Apostle Paul to us. And now we don't teach. We don't know what to teach others. We, we didn't listen to what God wanted to teach us. The Lord Jesus Christ, Luke 4, verse 15, He's teaching. He's teaching in their synagogues. He's teaching. He's driving out the spiritual ignorance that's been besetting the nation Israel for all these centuries. Haven't been listening to Moses. Had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. Israel didn't believe Moses. That's why they didn't believe Jesus. They refused to believe on him. Imposter, we have no king but Caesar. Blasphemer, nut. They called the Lord Jesus all kinds of malicious names. Ignorance is their problem. Unbelief. He's teaching the word that his father gave them, but they refused to hear it. So here he is teaching them again. You should already know this. You don't, Israel. Matthew 4. Let me keep reading. Matthew 4, verse 12 again. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtalim, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah, saying, this is the book of Isaiah chapter 9, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtalim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. He's teaching in their synagogues in Galilee. The people to whom he's preaching, they've been sitting in spiritual darkness, but they see great light. The day spring has visited them. Luke 1. They sit in the region in shadow of death. Light is sprung up. That's what Isaiah said would occur when Messiah arrived. Isaiah chapter 9. Opening verses. The close of chapter 8. Darkness. When Messiah comes, there's light. He's teaching his Father's word to Israel. 
This is what the Father wanted you to know all along, to believe all along. Didn't want to believe. Huh? Still don't. We'll see him as he conducts his earthly ministry, how Israel reacts to the God-man. We saw how they behaved concerning the king in Matthew. We saw how they responded to the servant in Mark. Now we'll see how they respond to the man in Luke. God-man. Luke 4. Luke 4. He's teaching in their synagogues, 15, being glorified of all. This man is different. He's unlike any rabbi or teacher that we've ever heard. <laughs> we'll see that later in the chapter as well. He's teaching in their synagogues. The synagogues, those were the Jewish places of worship throughout the then known world. Israel, 600 years prior, Solomon's temple had been burned, the Babylonians had attacked Jerusalem. Jerusalem fell. Israel lost her temple, Solomon's temple. Eventually, when they came back from the Babylonian captivity, Zerubbabel's temple was built, constructed. 500 years later, Herod the Great renovated it and expanded it. And Herod's temple is operating during Christ's earthly ministry. Well, during the time there was no temple, Solomon's temple was destroyed. It was during that time of the Babylonian captivity that Israel began to set up places of assembly where they could meet to read the Hebrew Bible on the Sabbath day. Saturday, Sabbath. They would meet together. They would assemble, synagogue, and meet to, quote, praise the Lord. And we use that expression as loosely as possible. Usually it was just to be religious. There was really no faith there at all. Just like in the temple. So here is the Lord meeting with them in their synagogues. He's being glorified of all. He's teaching the Jews on the days when they would be most receptive to spiritual light. Truth. They're, they're here to hear the Bible read. They're here to study the Bible. He takes advantage of it. And he meets in those synagogues all around Galilee. He observes the Sabbath day meeting to remember the Lord's purpose for Israel. That's what Israel should be doing on the Sabbath day. On the Sabbath days. Every week. Every Saturday. They're to meet. And remember what is God's purpose and plan for them. Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Remember, I'm the creator. And... Israel, I have created you as a nation to be my earthly people. To be my earthly people, my kingdom of priests. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Verse 16. So here is an example of of what the Lord is doing in the synagogue on the Saturday Sabbaths. This lesson 
this sermon that I will deliver here is actually an analysis of the first sermon that Jesus preached as recorded in the Bible. Luke 4, verse 16. Luke 4, 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture, Fulfilled in your ears. Stop there. I actually don't think we'll get any further in Luke than right there in this study. So we will expound, we will explain this first sermon of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why it's important. Luke 4, verse 16. Christ came to Nazareth. You remember the significance of Nazareth? Come back to chapter 1 of Luke. Chapter 1 of Luke. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Nazareth is the home of Joseph and Mary. That's Jesus' legal father and mother his foster father and his mother. Come over to Luke chapter 2. Chapter 2 of Luke, verse 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea. Verse 5. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. Joseph and Mary lived in Nazareth of Galilee. If we come back to Matthew, come back to Matthew, and I'm doing this chronologically. Matthew, Matthew chapter 2. So the Lord is now born. Herod the Great wants to kill him. He's no more than two years of age. Look in verse 14. Joseph took the young child and his mother, that's Mary, by night and departed into Egypt. Herod intends to kill the Christ child. So God sends an angel and directs Joseph, you take young Jesus and Mary, his mother, go down into Egypt and stay there until I tell you otherwise. So if we come over now, Matthew 2, verse 19, But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared, 
appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus, that's one of Herod the Great's sons, did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Many times the Bible refers to Jesus as Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Judah, Judea, Ephrata. We've covered that extensively in the past, back in chapter 2 of Luke. However, the Lord Jesus grew up. He spent a good part of his 30-year-long life at this point. Now in Luke 4, in Nazareth. He shall be called a Nazarene, a despised one. John chapter 1 shows us Nazareth <laughs> uh, didn't have a nice reputation. It was looked down, looked down upon. He shall be called a Nazarene. So the Lord Jesus lived in Nazareth. Once he came from Egypt, back out of Egypt, back into the land of Israel, he lived in Nazareth with Joseph and Mary. And if we come over now to Luke 2, at the close of Luke chapter 2, look at 2.51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. See, after he was born, Luke 2.39, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. So the Lord Jesus grew up in Nazareth. He's not a stranger in Nazareth. They've known about him for almost 30 years. So Luke 4.16 He shows up in Nazareth. Now, Matthew 4.13 He goes to Nazareth and then arrives in Capernaum. Well, what did he do in Nazareth, Matthew? Matthew doesn't tell us. The Holy Spirit withheld that information. Go to Luke 4 and you'll see. Why did Jesus leave Nazareth and go to Capernaum? Luke 4 explains, reveals the answer. Luke 4.16 So Christ Jesus comes to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he made this a habit. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Christ had a routine of visiting the synagogues on the Sabbath day and reading the Bible to the people there. He's under the law of Moses. Remember, this isn't Christianity. This is Judaism. They're observing the Sabbath day. Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5. The Lord Jesus was made of a woman, made under the law. He's under the law of Moses. He's not under grace. He's under law. And he obeys Moses. He remembers the Sabbath day. He keeps it holy. He sets it apart. He's mindful of his Father's word and will for Israel. 
by paying attention to the Hebrew Bible on the Sabbath day. And again, I remind you, Jesus is meeting with his fellow Jews because this is the time when they're most interested to receive, in receiving spiritual light. They've come here to hear the Old Testament scriptures. I'll teach them. I'll read them the Bible. After the law and the prophets were read, synagogue leaders would allow visitors to address the group. So the Lord took advantage of this procedure. Here is what synagogue worship was like at this time. Come over to Acts 13, Acts chapter 13. This is many years later, Acts 13. The Apostle Paul, he's on his first apostolic journey. Here is Paul's first sermon recorded in the Bible, Acts 13. He's called Saul at this time, at the beginning of 13, I should say. Verse 9, Paul. If we come down to Acts 13, 14. So Paul is traveling with Barnabas and John Mark. And they come to Antioch in Pisidia, modern Turkey, and went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Paul stands up, he beckons with his hand, and he said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. And Paul preaches. Look at verse 27. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew, that's Jesus Christ, not, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. The, the prophets are read every Sabbath day. The law and the prophets are read in the synagogues. Acts 15, verse 21. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. If this is when Israel is accustomed to hearing the law and the prophets, here comes Messiah Jesus on the Sabbath day synagogue services. Saturday, Sabbath, synagogue services. Say that th three times fast. <laughs> Saturday, Sabbath, synagogue services. There is the Lord Jesus. And he comes to his hometown synagogue. And he requests an opportunity to read. So he goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He's sitting down. He stands up. He's signaling, I have something to add. And there was delivered unto him, Luke 4.17, the book of the prophet Isaiah. He asked, may I have the Isaiah scroll? See, there was a chest in the front where they kept all the scriptures, a box. I want the Isaiah scroll. The law and the prophets are there. The Hebrew Bible is present in that synagogue in Nazareth. They have the word of God written down. This isn't oral. This is written. 
I'll say more about these texts shortly. For now, notice, I want the Isaiah scroll. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. So he holds a scroll of Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. How did the Lord Jesus Christ handle the Bible. That's all they had at that time was the Law of the Prophets, Genesis to Malachi, the Law, the Psalms, and the Prophets. They didn't have Matthew through Re Revelation yet. The Lord takes that Bible there, that book of Isaiah, And he searches, where is that particular passage I want? He reads, he's looking for those verses. Here, I found what I'm looking for. Let me read this to you. And he read. Okay. Remember what I've said many times, and I'll, I'll continue to repeat it. The scriptures mean everything to Jesus Christ. Everything. He's been listening to his father for 30 years. I'm listening. Father, what do you want me to tell them? Tell me so I can tell them. And he holds the Bible in high esteem. Isaiah. He takes Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. Isaiah, by this time of Luke 4, Isaiah lived seven centuries prior. Isaiah conducted his ministry 700 years before. The Lord Jesus He's aware of that. He assumes that whatever Bible is present in Luke 4 at the time of his earthly ministry, he believes that the Bible there in his lifetime was just as authoritative as what Isaiah wrote. 700 years previously. Here's an interesting concept. I've, I've told you many times about textual critics, textual criticism, where we've had lost people are Christians thinking like lost people approaching the Bible from a human perspective instead of a divine perspective? You'll hear Bible correctors all the time. Thank you, seminary, Bible cemetery, Bible college, quote, Christian university. There's so much unbelief in those institutions. It's awful. But people who learn nothing but speculations graduate those quote, institutions of higher learning. If they did happen to believe the Bible going in, by the time they get out, they certainly don't believe the Bible. Because they're taught to question the Bible. Oh, that sounds just like earlier in Luke 4, huh? Yea, hath God said, Genesis 3, yea, hath God said. 
adding to the Bible, taking from the Bible, watering down the Bible, denying the Bible. God didn't say it. God didn't say that. Yea, hath God said, Satan was questioning if thou be the Son of God, if thou be the Son of God. The Lord wasn't drawn away, seduced from his Father's word. Oftentimes, Christians are today. Satan's evil world system, in the form of, quote, Christian groups, institutions, they cause the preacher, the teacher, the translator, commentator, to doubt the Bible just like they do. And you'll hear today, for example, we don't have the original Bible. The original Bible, the autographs, the original Bible manuscripts are gone. We have nothing but apographs today, copies. Only the originals were inspired of God. We have copies today now riddled with errors. We don't really have what God wrote in the original manuscripts. So, it's the scholar's job to reconstruct what God lost. The scholar is to take all the manuscripts available and he's to search through the variant readings. Oh, this was, this was probably the original reading. No, not this. No, not that reading. This one is the original reading, and that, and 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 you get you get a a patchwork Bible there. It's like, well, yes, there's a proper reading here, but no, this reading is wrong there, and we'll take that reading, and 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 oldest is best, the two oldest and best manuscripts, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, those date back. to the 4th century. They are the closest to the originals. Well, if the 4th century is the closest we have to the originals, and the originals were in the 1st century, <laughs> woo! That's, what, 300 years off. No, God would not preserve His Word in the form of two, quote, old, manuscripts. God's design is to have a majority reading in manuscripts. A multiplicity of copies. If we're going to be Bible believers, we should believe what the Bible says about itself. Okay. Whatever version we're using, Whatever version we're using, we should believe what that version says about itself. The Lord Jesus, notice, listen, Luke 4, he took Isaiah, the Isaiah scroll, and he read it, didn't he, in Luke 4? Yes, he did. Jesus read the Isaiah scroll. He had it in his hand. He held it. Why is that important? Come over to Acts. The book of Acts. Okay. Book of Acts. The book of Acts. Chapter 8. The book of Acts, chapter 8. Okay. The angel of the Lord, verse 26, orders Philip, go and meet this Ethiopian eunuch, a lost man, Verse 28, the Ethiopian eunuch was returning from Jerusalem. He's going home. He's sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah, the prophet. Isaiah is the prophet. And you read in Acts chapter 8 here, keep reading, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch converse about Isaiah 53, 
the Ethiopian eunuch. He read Isaiah 53. Now, now listen. Think. Oh, think. I know it's not common in religion to think. When people open the Bible, they don't think. Here we do think. Okay. Hmm. If the eunuch had a scroll of Isaiah, that had to have been a personal copy, huh? That was his own copy. Unless, of course, he stole the one in Nazareth. Huh. Evidently, the Isaiah scroll in Nazareth is one copy. And the Isaiah scroll with the eunuch here, Acts 8, is another copy. Hmm. If we go over to Romans, book of Romans, chapter 9. Romans 9. Listen to Romans chapter 9. Romans 9, verse 27. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom, and been made like unto Gomorrah. Isaiah 10, Isaiah 1. Paul as a copy of Isaiah as well, huh? Oh, wait a minute, wait, ooh. Think about this one now. There's an Isaiah scroll in Nazareth. There's an Isaiah scroll with the Ethiopian eunuch. There's an Isaiah scroll with the Apostle Paul. Those are three separate copies, huh? They can't all be utilizing the same copy, can they? Uh, you mean the Bible itself teaches that manuscript copies are just as authoritative as the original manuscript? <gasps> oh, see, now that contradicts what we've heard the textual critics say. But see, they didn't believe the Bible anyway. Eh? See, as church members, we have been taught things about the Bible that the Bible no doesn't teach about itself. Eh? Like I said, We've heard speculations from the preachers, the commentators, the teachers, because they heard speculations in the seminary, Bible college, Bible cemetery. They didn't learn the pure Word of God. What they learned was the Bible through the lens of church tradition, human viewpoint, 1 Corinthians 2. And the Bible when examined through the lens of human eyes, philosophy, it will profit nothing. It's not the pure Word of God. The Holy Spirit teaches us through His words. This is how the Holy Spirit teaches. It's not learning about the Bible outside of the Bible. No, it's reading the Bible to learn what the Bible says about itself. Manuscript copies are just as authoritative as the originals. Provided, of course, those copies are copies of the originals and not corrupt copies. And not copies of corrupt manuscripts. And there are plenty of those two, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, corrupt. Remember, at the close of Mark 16, that extensive analysis of those final 12 verses of Mark that the textual critics claim weren't in the original book of Mark. Yes, they were in the original book of Mark, and I proved that. For those who had an eye to see, an ear to hear, and heart to believe, they see it, they heard it, they believed it. The apographs 
possess the same authority as the autographs. God inspired the original manuscripts. The original manuscripts, they disintegrated. They were burned. They were destroyed. They were worn out. But God preserved His Word through accurate copies of those autographs. We're not looking for the Word of God today, unless, of course, we don't want it. See, see we have it already. The King James Bible in English, and its underlying Masoretic Hebrew, and Textus Receptus Greek, we have the Bible today, preserved, inspired and preserved. People don't want that, though. They want to be their own authority, autonomous. Do what we want to do, just like Adam and Eve, just like Lucifer, Satan, just like Israel. We will not submit to that old book. So what do they do? They pretend like they don't have a Bible. Oh, we're looking for the Bible. We're reconstructing what the original Bible said, as best as we can, of course. We can't get it perfect, but that's why you give the scholars more and more time, and they'll make improvements, subsequent additions and improvements. We're getting closer to the original readings, but you'll never get free from the scholar's pen. You'll always have to come back and ask the scholar, what is the original reading? It's never settled then. The Bible's never settled. The scholar's always claiming, well, then, no, this reading. No, let's revise it. No, it, it should, should, the verse should have been like this. No, like that. No, this word's wrong. Take that verse out that we used it. Belief was inspired. No, that's wrong. Oh, put this verse in. We didn't think it was inspired before. Now we think it is. <laughs> See, that's what drives the modern Bible version. Market. Business. Money. Money, money, money. Reversions, reversions, revisions, revisions, revisions. A hundred modern English versions today. Supposedly getting closer and closer to the truth. Really, it's the opposite. Further and further away from the truth. The King James Bible is God's preserved word in English. Inspired, preserved word in English. In the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Deuteronomy, can, how can Moses and the prophets be read in the synagogue, in all those synagogues on the Sabbath day? They must have a lot of copies of Moses, the law, Genesis to Deuteronomy, and the prophets, the rest of the Bible. There must be copies all over for these synagogues to have them, to possess them. Now, see, they, they can't all be sharing <laughs> the original manuscripts for Moses' day, the original media, for Moses' day, they have to have copies. The eunuch, Jesus in Nazareth, the Apostle Paul, on and on and on. Even Peter, even the Apostle Peter quotes Isaiah. He has to have a copy of the Bible as well. Even before the printing press, there were copies. Now, yes, they were copied by hand, but there were written texts. They weren't passing Bible truth down orally. It was written. Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. Here, here is God's evaluation of manuscript copies. God, let's ask you, do you think manuscript copies are just as authoritative and reliable as the manuscript originals. Okay, now, now we're not going to listen for God to speak in an audible voice. He's already spoken about it. Let's find the answer God gave. Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy, he already answered the question that we asked him. Long before we asked, he answered Moses. Deuteronomy 17, 18. And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that's an Israeli king, that he shall write him a copy, a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. 
and it shall be with him. The copy shall be with the king, and he shall read therein. He sh the king shall read the copy all the days of his life. The Levites, they have the original manuscripts. The king is to have a copy made, and he's to study, not the originals, study the copy. That he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes, to do them. The king is to make a copy of God's word and study God's word, so he can know what God expects of him and the nation over which he reigns. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. God has preserved his words through a multiplicity of copies. We have, by faith we can say this, When we have a King James Bible, we have the very words of God perfectly preserved. You find a modern version user saying that you won't find one. <laughs> they believe their version has errors. Oh, and they believe the King James Bible has errors too. See, <laughs> they don't. They don't have the truth as they claim either then. They say our King James Bible is riddled with errors. Ask them, do you have a perfect Bible in your modern version? No. Oh, oh okay. So, wait, 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 wait. Let's think again. I, I, I really don't think they're using their brains here. But let's see if we can use ours. If I believe I have a perfect Bible... The King James Bible, and you say you don't have a perfect Bible, you want me to throw away what I believe to be a perfect Bible and pick up something, a modern version, that you don't believe is perfect. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense because it's not supposed to make sense. That isn't faith, it's unbelief, but that's what they learn in seminary, in Bible college. The scholar's job. <laughs> it's not to encourage faith, it's to encourage doubt. Because doubt, doubt will forever employ the scholar to sit in the position of authority. And the scholar will decide what the Bible says and what the Bible shouldn't say. Power. People want power, especially in religion. Be extremely careful. We do not submit to people. We submit to the book. We submit to the Holy Bible. We serve the Lord, not man. At least I hope we serve the Lord and not man. Luke 4, verse 17. So the Lord Jesus took Isaiah. He read Isaiah. This is what I want. And he reads Isaiah 61. And we'll get to it. Let me read you Luke 4 again. Verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So I'll put a marker in Luke 4, and turn to Isaiah 61. The 61st chapter of Isaiah, written 2,700 years ago, 700 years before Christ. Read it in Luke 4. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. 
verse 1 and verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison of them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Stop there. That didn't sound... verbatim with Luke 4, did it? There are variations, huh? Variations. Let's compare Isaiah 61. So put a, put a marker in Isaiah 61 and a marker in Luke 4 and we'll go back and forth. Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That points back to chapter 3 of Luke. Luke 3, 21. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Now remember in the book of Acts, Acts 10, 38. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit came upon him. His water baptism. Yeah. He's gone through the temptations, Luke 4, opening verses. He's preaching in Galilee. The Spirit of God is working through him, in and through him. He's teaching. He comes to Nazareth and he reads Luke 4.18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He knows who he is, huh? See how personal that is? Remember, the Lord Jesus, he is fully aware of what Father God's will is for him. He's not looking up in the air. God, show me. What do you want me to do? He's reading the Bible. He's reading the Hebrew Bible. He's studied the Hebrew Bible all these years now. Remember, he was astounding the doctors of religion. Judaism, back in chapter 2, he was asking them questions, and they were amazed to hear his answers. <laughs> his understanding. Well, here in chapter 4 now, he's 30 years of age approximately, and he knows the Spirit of God has anointed me. He's working in and through me. The Spirit of my Father... The Holy Ghost is guiding me. He is working in tandem with His Father. I know what God wants me to do. I know what my Father wants me to do here. I'm behaving in accordance with Him. I know who I am and I am operating according to that identity. Remember Satan had asked, if thou be, are you really God's son? Are you really God's son? Well, he is, and he hasn't forgotten it. Satan attempted to distract, sidetrack. Don't think about Father God. Think about something else. No, Satan, I refuse. I'm thinking about my Father. I'm concentrating on His plan for me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. I am preaching the gospel to the poor. Isaiah 61, it's 
The Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Euangelion, good tidings, glad tidings, gospel, good news. Now remember, don't be shallow minded, dear friend. The gospel, the gospel in Luke 4 is not our gospel. There's more than one gospel in the Bible. Only one gospel today. Only one baptism today. More than one baptism in the Bible. Only one church today. More than one church in the Bible. The gospel in Luke 4.18 is what? We read it already. Mark 1. Mark 1. Remember, compare. Compare verses. Mark 1. 14. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 4, 17. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And verse 23 again. Matthew 4, 23. Jesus went about all Galilee. He's teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. He is Messiah, he's Christ, he's King, he's Redeemer, he's Savior, Son of David, Son of Abraham, Son of God. That's the gospel of the kingdom. It's who Jesus is. There's nothing about the cross. God doesn't expect Israel to know anything about the cross at this time. Nothing about Calvary, Christ dying for their sins, nope. It's simply who He is. Our gospel is He died for our sins. The gospel of grace. Christ died for our sins. Buried, raised again. 1 Corinthians 15. And this time it's the gospel of the kingdom. That's all God expects them to know. They're to rise. Israel is to rise to kingdom glory. And then when they're in the kingdom, salvation and blessing, they're to go to the Gentiles. Okay, moving on. Have to move. Luke 4, verse 18. Christ Jesus is preaching the gospel to the poor. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. Isaiah 61. The poor are called the meek. Jesus interprets the meek there as the poor. Poor in spirit, Matthew 5, 3. Humble. Humble. Now, by preaching the gospel of the kingdom... Jesus fulfills a five-point plan. Okay? So look at Luke 4.18. I am preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Okay? The Father has sent me to do five things by me preaching the gospel of the kingdom. I will, one, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Two, preach deliverance to the captives. Three, recovering of sight to the blind. Four, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Five, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. By Jesus preaching the gospel of the kingdom, those five elements are accomplished. Those five tasks. The Father has sent me. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. That's the idea of apostle. Sent one. The Father has sent me. Many times Jesus speaks about this. The Father has sent me. For example, Matthew 10, 40. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. I am sending people. Whoever receives those people, they receive me. And if they receive me, they receive the Father who sent me. And he's speaking of the twelve apostles there. He's sending them forth. Sent ones. They're sent out. They're sent to Israel. Matthew 10, verse 5, 6, 7. He sends them forth. The twelve apostles are preaching what Jesus Christ sent them to preach. And he is preaching what his father has sent him to preach. So, he is Israel's apostle too. Jesus in Hebrews 3, the Lord Jesus, Hebrews 3, Hebrews 3, verse 1, Wherefore?
Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is, a, is an apostle. The Father sent him as his spokesman. Son, I want you to teach them. You are the Word, John 1. The Word, the communicator of the Trinity or Godhead is the second member of the Godhead, Jesus Christ. Christ speaks for the Father and the Holy Spirit there. He's their representative. In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2.9, in Christ. If Israel accepts His apostles, they accept Him. And if they accept him, they accept his father who sent him. Now, if we want to fellowship with Jesus Christ today, with the Godhead today, with the Father today, we listen to Christ's spokesman to us. Who's that? Now, it's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's not Jesus and his earthly ministry. It's the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. Acts 26, Acts 26, verse 17. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Paul is sent right here. Now historically it was Acts chapter 9, but it's recorded in Acts 26. Paul is sent. Apostle. Saul of Tarsus is the apostle of the Gentiles. Romans 11, 13. Romans through Philemon, that's God's word to us today. The, the dispensation of grace. Dispensation of grace. Romans through Philemon. If we don't want to listen to what the Lord Jesus Christ says through the Apostle Paul, then we're really not interested in listening to the Lord Jesus Christ in the dispensation of grace. We can go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all we want. That's, that is God's word. That's not God's word to and about us, though. And yet, where is all the, quote, Christian teaching and preaching? The vast majority is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You hear it all the time. Sermons, podcasts, books, always running to the law. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The law of Moses is operating. That's Judaism. That's not grace. You want to find grace? Find the dispensation of grace in the Bible. Romans through Philemon, the Apostle Paul's ministry. Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Okay, get back to Luke 4. I want to get to expounding Christ's sermon here. Time is running short. <laughs> Luke 4. Luke 4. I am preaching the gospel to the poor. I am sent. The Father has sent me. See the personal touch in Luke? The Father sent me to heal the brokenhearted. The brokenhearted, they're affected, aren't they? They're extremely sorrowful. They're crushed internally. They've witnessed the destructive nature of sin. How sin has affected their nation, their lives. And they're looking to God for deliverance. Joel 2, Joel 2, the little book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 13. Hosea, Joel, Joel 2, 13. Here was God's message to them back then. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth Him of the evil. When the Jews would be outraged, they'd tear their garments. No, if you want to be outraged, what matters the most is tear your heart. Be moved internally. They are to be healed. Heal the brokenhearted. You know, they're healed, they're saved. Salvation, healing. They, they believe on Jesus as Messiah, the gospel of the kingdom. 
The Father sent me to preach deliverance to the captives. I'm preaching deliverance to the captives. Isaiah 61. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. I bind them up. I bind up the brokenhearted. I heal the brokenhearted. I proclaim liberty to the captives. Isaiah 61.1 I preach deliverance to the captives. Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49.24 Satan interrupts God as he speaks of Israel in the earth doing his will. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? Satan boasts. How can you do anything with Israel, God? They're mine. They're captive to me. They're under sin. They've broken the old covenant. They can't be your people if they've broken the old covenant. God says in response there, Isaiah 49, 25, But thus said the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. The Messiah will fight to save Israel from sin, from Satan. 26, And I will feed them. Really, it'll be at the cross. He'll fight Satan. Pay for Israel's sins, and I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood, as with sweet wine, and all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior, and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. I will free Israel from satanic bondage, captivity. When he performs those exorcisms in his earthly ministry, we'll see one at the near the close of Luke 4. He's teaching Israel, I can deliver you from Satan, from evil spirits, into the kingdom. Isaiah 59, 20, Romans eleven twenty six. 26, Israel, your Messiah is your deliverer. He's come to preach deliverance to the captives. They're captive to Satan. In the book of Psalms, Psalms 42 to 72, the Lord Jesus is described as Israel's deliverer. He will lead captivity captive at his return, at his second coming. Psalm 68, the Lord will take Satan captive. Whereas Satan once held Israel captive, God will free Israel by capturing her oppressor, the devil. And Satan will be the prisoner now. <laughs> if you read in the Old Testament, the Lord will turn Israel's captivity. Deuteronomy 30, verse 3, 2 Chronicles 6, 37, Psalm 126, 1 and 4, Jeremiah 29, 14, Zephaniah 3, 20. God turns Israel's captivity. He rescues them. Just like Job. Job 42.10. God turned Job's captivity. Job was oppressed of Satan. Huh? Well, the same way with Israel. Israel's oppressed. Job suffering under Satan is a picture of Israel suffering under Satan. Job was restored. He was delivered. Israel will be restored as well. The Lord, come back to Luke 4. Luke 4. What else is he doing in Israel? He's recovering of sight to the blind. He's recovering sight for the blind. Isaiah 61. Notice Isaiah 61, 1. There's nothing about recovering of sight to the blind. That's what the Lord added. And see, he was the original author of Isaiah. He added these words to elaborate on what he had written through Isaiah 700 years earlier. And he has the authority here in Luke 4 to add recovering of sight to the blind. There are a lot of blind people in Israel. Not just physically. This is actually referring to spiritual blindness. 
Isaiah 29, 18. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. Isaiah 42, 7. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. See? Ignorance. This is spiritual blindness, ignorance. Isaiah 42, 16. And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not, and I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. That's Israel's restoration. Jesus' is healing miracles, the physical sight restored when he heals the blind, that depicts him healing Israel of spiritual blindness in the kingdom. In the kingdom. He will recover sight to the blind. Isaiah 35, 5. The eyes of the blind shall be opened. Now there is literal the healing miracles when he heals blind people. The gospel of the kingdom will also set at liberty them that are bruised. Isaiah 61, verse 1. And the opening of the prison of them that are bound. They're captive to Satan, aren't they? They're smitten. They're shattered. They're broken by calamity. They're bruised. They will be freed. They're under Gentile oppression. They're in vain works religion. Israel will be loosed from all her shackles. All that binds and prevents her from being God's people in the earth, God liberates her from that. Luke 4, 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The acceptable year of the Lord, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now is the time to trust your Messiah. The time is fulfilled, Mark 1. Repent ye and believe the gospel. The kingdom is at hand. Your Messiah is born. He's preaching here to you. In the Nazareth synagogue, you're expected to believe on him. <laughs> Israel will waste that opportunity. And for three years they will oppose him. Finally they will demand his crucifixion. We have no king but Caesar. We don't want you. We don't want anything you have to offer us. We're content under the Gentiles. We're content under Satan. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Verse 20. So Jesus read Isaiah 61. And then he closes the book. He closed the book. And he gave it again to the minister, the servant there, the synagogue servant, and sat down. Here, put it away. Back in the chest. I read Isaiah. Put it back in the chest. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. They heard him read Isaiah, and they're like this. Shock. They're staring at him. They're gazing. They're captivated. You've never heard a preacher like this, a rabbi like this before. A message. They're spellbound. A message. We've never heard of something like this before. And plus he applied that passage to himself. Oh, that's a Messiah. That. That's a passage of Messiah. He's claiming to be Messiah. And there's something else that happened. The way Jesus read, he handled Isaiah, that was unexpected. Let me read to you again Isaiah 61, and you'll notice 61.2 To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Jesus didn't read all of that, huh? He didn't read the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. And then verse 3, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Well, that's the kingdom. That's why. See, you notice verse 21 the Lord Jesus was a dispensationist. Luke 4, 21. This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. 
all the way up to the preaching, the acceptable year of the Lord. That's all that's been fulfilled up to this point in my life, my ministry here. The day of vengeance of our God, that's future. That's not in His earthly ministry. That's not His first coming. To comfort all that more, that's not in His first coming. That's in the millennium. That's His second coming. He knew precisely where to stop on the Bible timeline. And if I remove this, please don't get too overwhelmed. But you've seen it before. We're so late in the video, though. We're certainly not going to review all of this. <laughs> Make some quick points. The Lord Jesus knows. Here he is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I'll just put Matthew to John here. There he is in Matthew to John. He knows. On the Bible timeline, here we are. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. All of that, that's my first coming. I'm preaching that message so that all of that stuff can be accomplished. The day of vengeance and to comfort all that more. That's not in the first coming. That's future. Second coming. Day of vengeance. That's Daniel's 70th week. And the second coming. Fiery wrath. Baptism with fire. Vengeance of our God. That's not at my first coming. We'll talk about that later. My first coming, Isaiah 61, up to the preaching, the acceptable year of the Lord. That is being fulfilled. Now, remember the Bible timeline. See? Jesus is a dispensationist. His first sermon shows us. He knows where he is on the Bible timeline. He's not wondering, oh, is this going to happen now? Or is it future? Is the vengeance, the wrath to be poured out now at my first coming? No. Second coming. When do I comfort all that more? No, not my first coming. Second coming. Kingdom. Me. That's what we do when we approach the Bible dispensationally. Where does it fit on the timeline? It's not all applicable. It's all true at the same time. It's what is God doing at that precise moment on the timeline. And don't confuse what He's doing today with what He did in the past or what He'll do in the future. Well, Jesus understood what my father's doing today in my earthly ministry is not what he's not, not what he will do in the future or what he did in the past is what he's doing now. See? And that's why they were gazing at him is you didn't finish the thought. Why didn't you finish the thought? Why didn't you bring up the vengeance of our God? You broke the thought there. And the comforting of all that mourn. It's not time. It's not time. Okay. So we'll continue next lesson. The next lesson. How else the audience in the Nazareth synagogue responds. Read the rest of Isaiah. <laughs> Read the, the rest of Luke chapter 4 if you want. And you'll see how they react to Christ. Not very cordial, to put it mildly. We'll see that next time. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to teach. Thank you for your word, preserved in English, the King James Bible. May we study it, be grateful that we have it. Yes, we have your word preserved in English, perfectly preserved, uh, fully authoritative. We can trust it. It is without error. Thank you for this opportunity to study it. May we believe it in the heart in Christ's name. Amen.